Okay, so uh, what I hear is definitely the organizations are talking about various kind of inclusion and diversity, but still largely the focus has been on gender. Maybe by mere the statistics and number, uh, because of the women being in a larger number now and having to make them included in the organization is not just a good to two thing now, it's become a business imperative. But I'm curious to know in how many organizations, because we go to a lot of organizations since we see a lot of women in the diversity council and working on gender initiatives, how many organizations have you come across where you see men really leading, leading the agenda? Most of the organization, that's good to hear. So good to hear that DNI agenda is being run by men. In fact, our DNI champion whom you will meet at the award session also personifies that. I would now like to call upon Sarika, who will be moderating the next panel, aptly named, including men in gender initiatives. Sarika? Sarika is one of the three co-founders of Altavis and the Zivas. She's also the face and steering wheel of the organization, having a vision which captures and encapsulates the changing trends of a society before most of us can even visualize this, is a trait that very few of us have, and that's precisely the uniqueness of Sarika. So gentlemen, ladies, please put your hand together for Sarika Gupta Bhattacharya. Thank you, Shilpi and Rashmi. You had a great start. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to actually invite some of these brave men who have decided to join me on the first panel, and that's including men in gender initiatives. I mean, a great brave men because they are willing to be in a, a primarily woman-dominated audience, being moderated by a woman, and then still get chance to speak. So yes. OK, the first brave man, Mr. Samit Chadda, who has been believing in the cause of the Zivas. Yes, please. He's not only a great champion of women leadership and diversity and inclusion agenda, but something very unique about him. He, is, he calls himself a movie buff. Now, when questioned, he said, possibly, the love of the movies possibly started because SRK, as we know as Shah Rukh Khan, was his batchmate. Now, that's something which we need to talk about further, Sami. Um, the next panelist is Mr. Sanjay Modi. He is the managing director at Monster.com. Again, one of the great believers in this agenda. Both of them have been brave enough to be in my panel second year in a row. And also, something which nobody knows about it, at least in our outside circle, that he's a national level tennis table, uh, table tennis player. Thank you so much, Sanjay, joining us. The third panelist of the day of this panel, Mr. B.L. Narayan, as we all call him B.L. He has a tall task of managing more than 60,000 people. In my last note, it was 56,000, which was two days back. And within two days, they decided to add more people. So I have to keep change, checking with him every day. 60,000 people in Capgemini, India, as the CHRO, the chief HR officer. He is a dog lover. And as a family, they have rescued more than 100 stray dogs from the roads. And, and they have adopted three dogs as well. Very cute names, which I decided to share over here. Coco, Scooty, Trixie. Now you get it, why I decided to share it over here. The fourth panelist, Mr. Rajiv Gupta, partner at Boston Consulting Group. Now, Rajiv is really, really passionate and crazy about two things, cricket and Bollywood. But who is not in India? But his passion takes it to a next level altogether. I remember in the last World Cup, the World Cup before this one, where we lost, the World Cup where we won, he actually took some time off from his so-called really, really a um, hectic job to actually travel with the press team of Reuters and cover the matches, and that too at his own personal cost. Now, that takes a lot of passion and commitment. He's also a big Bollywood music buff, so if you want to get your iPod or your laptop or your phone updated with the latest music, you know whom to catch. Thank you so much, Rajiv, for joining in. Uh, last but not the least, another brave man, Mr. Ranjit Oak. He's the chief business officer at Make My Trip. He's not only making, he's not only making our dream holidays come true, but he's also a music buff. And he's seen regularly jamming at a couple of local groups in Gurgaon. Thank you so much. 
for joining in, guys. I actually believed in the fact that I got to know from a lot of your uh, people in the Barclays, and we worked together many right. times. Barclays has been working on the He For She campaign. In fact, we launched it on 8th of March, International Women's Day. In fact, for some people um, who don't know, He For She campaign is one of the well-known campaigns of UN Women, which they launched it last year to actually include men in the gender initiatives across the globe. And Emma Watson had done a remarkable opening speech, which was talked about for many, many days to come. And Barclays adopted this campaign. So what prompted you to adopt this campaign? What was the reason behind it? Yes, I I, I think, you know, Barclays has been uh, pushing diversity in multifaceted ways for some time. In India specifically, our focus has been on uh, gender because we feel we can move the needle quite a bit. And uh, globally, it was felt that we need to involve men more in the, you know, initiative at least of gender diversity and he for she kind of sits very nicely in that space. I personally, you know, so we launched it in, um, in Delhi recently uh, during the International Women's Day. I think it's a pretty cool slogan because it's quite easy to remember and I think quite simple in what it's trying to uh, explain. So basically that's why. And uh, did you see any kind of a reaction to it from the men? Did you see that it ultimately helped men to be a part of this initiative? Yes, yeah, so, you know, I, my own sense on this is that, uh, you know, whether it uh, inspired men, I, I guess, is one question. But we in Barclays at least have been involving men in the whole gender initiative for quite some time. Because I have to confess that stated, unstated, you know, whispered, said slightly loudly, sometimes this whole focus on, um, you know, gender diversity almost leads itself to the question of is there reverse discrimination happening for men, right? And I think there is that slight buzz that happens at times that, you know, what is the big deal with this little black box of, you know, women, women, women all the time? And, you know, what about men, right? And I think that's why we're involving men in this agenda, so they can actually participate in the uh, conversation. Also, I think, um, you know, the, the, the thing that at least I speak at, uh, you know, various events in Barclays on this issue, and, and I think what we try to explain to men is that we're not trying to create a fast track for women in the slightest, right? We're trying to create an equal track for women, and an I think that's an equal opportunity for women, and I think that's the message. So therefore, I think he for she, uh, you know, from that point of view, I hope at least all the, uh, you know, men get this clear that there is no reverse discrimination. There is, I do think that women do have these life issues around marriages, around children, etc., and we need to create that supporting environment to kind of take them forward, yeah, so. Great. In fact, I must, uh, uh, I mean, mention over here, Barclays has one of the few organizations where they have a GNI lead person who is a man. And I think that also makes a lot of difference at times. Thank you so much. Yeah. He's actually in the room, so. Yeah, yeah. Somit, can we have his hand up, please? Yeah. A great so, guy. Yeah. So, uh, Sanjay. Uh, your organization, Monster, deals with so many uh, different HR heads and business heads of different organizations and they are into hiring, you help them on that. Uh, have you seen them facing any particular challenge in diversity hiring or anything which you think they should do differently? Uh, most of the guys that we speak to, uh, they said, yes, we want to drive the diversity agenda. But, but largely it is uh, the challenge in terms of getting applicants. Now, yesterday only, before this event, I was doing a, a you know, kind of a database analysis on Monster. What we found was 75, though we don't ask for gender, way back in 1994, when, when in the internet space we were the first to launch, we were very clear that we will be an equal opportunity employer. So gender is not a mandatory field. But there are a lot of people who would specify gender. It's approximately 75% on Monster are still men. 25% are women. Then we went a little bit deeper to see how it breaks by the industry. And we found that in almost all the industry sectors, men are still way ahead. Couple of industry sectors where women are coming close or giving them a fight is around the services sector. So let's talk about education, hospitality, banking, financial, um, IT, ITS, and that too between 25 to 35%. So that's the big challenge that most of the organizations put in front of us, saying what we can do. And that's the reason we launched Women on the Go section um, on Monster. You're one of the partners for that. That's right. And, and we have approximately 3,000 jobs live, uh, specifically put by organizations saying that we want to hire women.
In fact, at this juncture, I would also mention to a lot of organizations who are here, BizDiva is also partners with Monster.com on that particular job portal. And uh, if any of these kind of senior, mid to senior leadership positions are available, where you're specifically looking for women, or even generally otherwise, uh, this portal has been very, very helpful for a lot, for a lot of people. So do connect with us on that. Yeah. Just to uh, build on that, a couple of other points is, uh, you know, when you are looking at uh, uh, women and the jobs, etc., the the organizations are not trying to do, and that's the shift we are seeing over the last 18 months. They are not doing it to fulfill their corporate social responsibility, right? It has somehow moved in as a business dynamics, and the reason is that we are seeing a seismic shift from capital investment to intellectual capital, right? People are becoming the core. And women happens to be the largest talent pool. So if I keep on coming as an organization saying, you know, I don't find the right talent, et cetera, our first statement to them is, are you looking at women as a talent? And if you are, then what you are doing to get them to apply to you or look at opportunities? Because, because whatever initiatives you take on the education side, the results will be felt 10 years down the line. And the business is changing fast. At this juncture, I pose this question to Pierre, and I mean, 60,000 people in your organization, that's not a small number. I mean, I'm sure, what is the ratio right now in, in uh, the gender diversity ratio? Yeah, overall, uh, like what Sanjay said, uh, you know, the IT industry is in the range of about 25 to 35 uh, percent. Uh, one third population has been the best in class, 25 is what uh, you find. We are at somewhere in the middle, we are about 28 percent overall uh, in India. Uh, globally, we are slightly better, but in India, we are about 28%. Um, any particular ways which you have kind of worked towards in making it, and because the, at the end of the day, you have around 70% of the population as men. So do you get a kind of a setback on this particular agenda that, okay, when we are going to the campus hiring or anywhere else, how do you make sure that the male managers who are hiring or doing promotions or recruitment, how do you make sure that both of them are talking the same language? It's not like sure. us versus them. But at the end of the day, how do you make sure that it works together? How do you make sure that it works together? So, uh, you know, for a start, even the panel that we use, uh, we do make sure that there is a certain representation of women in that. Uh, that makes it easier. That makes it a little more balanced. Uh, but just coming to the overall ability to attract, uh, you know, women candidates at the start, uh, if you look at the uh, bulk of our hiring is our engineers from campuses mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, uh, you find engineering colleges by and large produce around 30% uh, women uh, graduates. Uh, so what we get is a representation of what is available in the market, right? Now, uh, having said that, uh, that's an easy uh, solution or easy way out. I think the, the real challenge would be for us to step up and possibly take that particular ratio up at the start. So if I'm only recruiting 30%, I have slippages down the uh, progression career. And as a consequence, what happens is at a middle level, it then slips to 20%. At the senior level, it slips to 10%. So our challenge, our challenge is to essentially start at a much higher level of uh, mix. And I think IT industry is conducive for that. We should possibly be raising the bar and try and uh, sort of position it around 40% to 50% and not be satisfied with 30% and taking an easy uh, justification that uh, women graduates are only 30%, so you know it's, it's quite a fair representation. So I think that's where the challenge remains. Uh, Rajiv, you have been working with consulting firms, first with Accenture, then with uh, KPMG, now with BCG. Um, it's pretty competitive and a highly stressful career or path if you look at it. What's the kind of numbers of women you see? I mean, and what would you kind of, do you see a difference in terms of the way, they, have you seen them dropping out because of the stress or because of the reasons or have you seen in organizations they are trying to kind of help these women to kind of stay back, be on the path? So, um, I mean, consulting is a great career, not, not as stressful as you think. <laughs> Am I audible? No. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, see, it is a direct proportion of the initiatives that you put in place. Uh, in Boston Consulting Group, for instance, uh, I have come to the realization, I've, I've been there less than a year now, that it has the highest percentage of women amongst consulting workforce. Um, so we have 35% women, in, you know, similar to what uh, we were saying, we have 35% women, which from a consulting standpoint is quite unique. The reason is our intake, whether you call it biased or not, is from a very specific set of colleges. 
those set of colleges have only 10% women by definition. So if, if it's I'm A, B, C that we're largely recruiting from, the average number of women, uh, Professor Niharika might you know, be able to shed some light, but the, the latest stats we had was some 10 to 12%, 15% is the best you can get. But our recruitment of intake, and there's no bias, there's no reverse discrimination at all. We, we think our recruitment process is very stringent, very rigid, very analytical. The students are given the same cases and so on and so forth, but the intake from these colleges tends to be much higher, much more skewed towards women. Given some of the life changes that women do go through and given that consulting intrinsically is a traveling business, there are dropouts and that's a reality and that's one of our biggest challenges in gender initiative of, uh, and women initiative that we have to deal with. Uh, and that, what that means is that by the time you get to partnership or directors and so on, the percentage of women is lower. But even then, if you look at our, com our competitors amongst the strategy consultants, we do have the highest number of women as partners. Uh, it is an uh, initiative, so our gender or our uh, women initiative, WI lead, is our CEO who happens to be a man, Rich Lesser. So it is a board agenda, it is a CEO agenda, and if, uh, if a board typically has more than 90% men, and if you accept the premise that this needs to be a board initiative, then 90% of the initiative has to be driven by men. I mean, there is no other option really. But do you also think when you both of both BL and Rajiv talked about the women dropping out from the career progression as they move up the ladder, and uh, do you think men play a very critical part? And then this is a question open to all of you: Do men play or male managers out there? Because un I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, 70, 80 percent of the population is men, and therefore the chances and probability of having a manager who is a male is higher. Do they play a very, very critical role? in making sure that the kind of support women need during those times so that they don't drop off. How do you make sure, and, or what would you advise to those male managers to really retain that good talent? Yeah, if I can start. Uh, I think uh, in terms of awareness, uh, I, I still believe there is some distance to be bridged there. Uh, people are making efforts. There are, uh, uh, you know, good cases we have come across where retention has been very good within certain teams where uh, the manager happens to be a man and, uh, and he's been able to sort of uh, create that atmosphere or the ecosystem there. But it's not uh, consistent across. So what, what we find is varying uh, degrees of uh, responsiveness uh, to that phase and, and that's not really helping. Uh, so we, we need to sort of bring this up and possibly try and uh, do more on the awareness part uh, to see them through that f uh, critical phase. Uh, I, I think it, we are not doing enough as, as we speak now. We see pockets of uh, uh, you know good uh, uh, behavior there but not always. No, yeah. I, so, uh, yeah, from, my, from my experience, what I've seen is, uh, the, I think it's a joint responsibility uh, of the managers as well as the, the people on the team, and be it men or women. Uh, in the case of women, I think that the approach, wherever I've seen it work, is where you look at it as a full career, and not just an assignment to assignment or level to level basis, where you're thinking that at this level, I'm moving in so many years, to the next level and that's the experience that I want to catch. Uh, most of the places where it gets slipped is where the organization is not looking at it at, at a career level. So the handoff that happens from one manager to the other doesn't happen in the right way. The expectation setting that happens uh, with the employee doesn't happen in the right way. And why I say it's a joint ownership is because if you look at it as a full career, uh, it's also the responsibility of the women managers to say that at the stage in life when I can, I should be taking up the experiences that will be, you know, making me feel confident to take up more senior roles. Can you give an example on this? Right? So I'll give an example. So from my days uh, when I was doing sales, which is another, like consulting, a uh, very tough one to deal with uh, from a diversity point of view, we would look at, um, you know, new hires coming into, into our sales organization. This is in your first career? In, in my career. earlier, yeah, in my earlier career with uh, Procter & Gamble. And you would, uh, you would have women managers coming into the workforce, uh, you know, fresh from, uh, from campus. And at that point, if they are at a stage where they are able to take up more challenging assignments or even locations that they are a little more flexible at that stage, it would build an experience set for them to be able to come back at a later stage, probably two levels later on, with, you know, being ready with those experiences, rather than reaching a stage in life where they have to then start making those choices. And that's where the drop-offs start happening. But isn't that an organizational thing? Because at the end of the day, a person 
man or a woman, when he enters or he or she enters the organization, can't decide that these are the kind of experiences because it's a lot dependent on the manager and the HR and the organizational career path being charted out. So doesn't this become an organizational agenda? I have a, I have a slight difference of opinion to that. Um, see, an organization has some guidelines and some boundary conditions, and that's fine. And most of us work in large organizations, you have to have that. But the DNA is defined by individuals. Um, so if I take my own personal example, uh, fairly early in my career, we were having a baby. And having a baby is almost deemed a woman thing and the challenges that they need to go through. In my case, my wife was going through some medical complications. And I was a consultant at that time, three years, four years out of college, so not, not really senior from a career perspective. And I needed to work from home in 2001 when working from home wasn't that. Uh, in fact, I didn't even consider the option working from home. That phrase had not been coined as such. I had this problem, and I spoke to my manager, who was male. And he said, just stay home. Just do whatever you can. If you can't, that's fine. Almost overnight, things were taken care of. And these are, at that point in time, every consulting project seems like the end of the world. This just seemed it's so critical, it's so important. But things were just taken care of. That was my experience as a consultant. Now imagine what that does to me whenever I've had women or anyone, and, the, and when I share this story with 10 other people in my organization, that's the culture you start driving. So my previous organ, the organization I was working for had some rules, had some guidelines. What I was doing was outside those guidelines because my boss agreed with it. And that's the culture that gets driven out, down. So organizations are important, but it's yeah. Us on this floor, all of us, Absolutely. we drive the culture. Yeah. 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 Just, to yes, and Jen, go ahead. Yeah. Then we'll have so, some in adding in. Yes. Yeah. Just to build on that, I think there are there are two aspects to it. On one hand, at the organization level, yeah. On one hand, it's the uh, organization level where we are talking about there are policies and framework to help. But I think there is still a lot of work that needs to be done to map the personal life cycle and a professional life cycle of a woman, right? That, that work has still not been done wherein when we, when we hire a woman at whatever stage, can we map out a career 10 years down the line because there are life cycle changes which the family, which the lady will go through. The second aspect is, though we are talking at the organization, but I think the biggest point is the family unit. Organization is the representation of the family unit. So as a family, both the individuals need to decide what kind of a progression they would like to take. I don't think so irrespective of what organizations can pursue or introduce. If you are not getting the right cooperation and support at the family level, that you will be able to translate at the work level. So I think the choice set. For the men as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so here it is not a question of gender. I'm saying since family and organization are representations of each other, irrespective of how you are taking your career, largely depends on the decisions that you take at a family level. Samir, I see you no, no, I, I, reflecting something on this. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just saying that it's interesting, uh, the, the point that was being made about it being a board level agenda and BCG, right? So uh, the group chief exec of Barclays, we, he has seven uh, publicly sp stated goals of which one is to improve gender diversity for senior women, right? So it is clearly at the group level, right? I, kind of, uh, you know, uh, I'm very passionate about the agenda within Barclays. But one thing I do feel that as you go down the, you know, the chain, right, I'm not sure about how much people really embrace it, right? And, you know, male colleagues as an example, and I, you know, not to hit on male colleagues, but the point is that we recently, actually it's okay to hit on male colleagues, we're all men on the panel here, but <laughs> the, uh, the point, yeah, yeah, so the, uh, no, it's actually good to be in an audience where women are clapping for men, frankly, so, yeah, anyways. So, <laughs> and you so, get a chance to speak, as you said. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> for 40 minutes. Yeah, for 40 minutes, 32 minutes, but anyways, okay. So the, um, so, the, so the deal is that we've recently in Barclays, for example, we've changed maternity leave from the minimum uh, kind of, uh, you know, mandatory number of 12 weeks to, we've doubled it to almost 22, right? So, you know, I personally feel great about it, my leadership team feels pretty good about it, etc. Right? But if you're a guy who's down on the chain, has three women in his team, and you know, God help him if two go on mat leave at the same time, he has to now manage work. Right? So therefore, I think there is this almost inherent in this whole you know, more for less world, where we are reducing you know, kind of headcounts, and yet you want work increasing. Right? What we are trying to do now in Barclays is we're trying to see that can we 
support male colleagues, for example, so when we are trying to do some training now, we are trying to come up with some training around how to deal with women colleagues who are about to go on maternity and who come back from maternity, right? And not just for women who are you know, trying to help them through that process, but how do you take male colleagues through that process, right? Because on the assumption that male colleagues have wives or will have wives at some point in time, etc., they hopefully that's something they empathize with, right? We are trying to, so all of Barclays globally, the top two grades, which are director and managing director, have gone through unconscious bias trainings. Right? We are now going to percolate it down you know, the chain. Right? So I do believe that we can create all the policies we want in the minds and hearts of people down the ground if they don't embrace it as something that they need to do, which is the right thing. Right? We are trying to kind of create that framework so that you know, people can get trained, people can again understand and get the nuances of you know, why what we are doing is important. A uh, valid thing which you said that until this, the policies can be made and the trainings can be done, but at the end of the day, training is a one day, a few hours. I mean, 60,000 people, 50,000 people in an organization, how many days can you give them in a mandatory training? And training doesn't change mindsets and behaviors, let's face it. It's, it's, it's a skill which is uh, something which is conditioned over a period of time. Or I would not say a skill, but a behavior which is conditioned over a period of time. And the changing scenario around the ecosystem is also needs to support that. Over here at this point of time, I would also like to understand from each one of you, from your organizational perspective, other than the fact, because at the end of the day, organizations are a mirror reflection of the society around you. You will ultimately get the same talent which is out there in the ecosystem. Is there something specific you are doing to make this work for you? Because as you all pointed out, that there is a lack of talent pool, whatever said and done, because as Raji pointed out, the number of women in the Ivy League schools, business schools, are relatively less, and yet we need to look at the larger numbers. Or in the IT space, as you're saying, that you go to the engineering colleges, and therefore, you do not be able to get it. So anything specific, you, and I'm not calling it a CSR initiative, it's a business initiative at the end of the day. Anything specific to some of these systemic failures, or I would say that some of the systemic uh, lacunae which are there, uh, how are you addressing them? Is there something specific which each, any of your organizations doing it? You, you, you know, we, we looked at, uh, uh, in our case, we, we found uh, data suggested that about uh, three to five years of experience, we have a huge amount of dropouts uh, in uh, women employees. Uh, and when we analyzed that, and we had a lot of interactions with groups of people there, and, and what we realized was uh, there is the monetary dimension that they see, and that's the earning at that stage of their career. Uh, and they've not actually looked at it as a career, they looked at it as a job. And then they realized that they're earning a certain X amount, and that X amount is not so critical in the context of their family or the other priorities that they may have. So they're weighing that vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, if I don't do this job, am I worse off or my family is worse off? So the, 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 the point of reference is the earning of that day or that period and not what potentially it would be uh, five years down the road if they start to embrace it as a career and then progress. So, uh, you know, it's not about five lakhs I can do without, or should you look at my earning potential of maybe 20, 30 lakhs uh, you know, in, in a few years. And, and that makes it a little more career minded. And that's the conviction in the mind of the em uh, women employee, which we don't seem to be working upon because they then take those uh, decisions and, and then we lose them at a critical stage where they could have actually benefited. So that's something that we're working, uh, working on. Uh, and we believe uh, that could have some good results as well if we start. But that's for your women employees. I'm talking more about from the ecosystem. I'm talking about are we doing enough on the education space? I mean, there are certain um, organizations who are right now sponsoring, um, uh, taking initiatives to actually promote more and more women to the colleges, um, or kind of you know working towards creating a kind of a, a space where women feel comfortable enough or coming back from sabbatical. In fact, I would like to ask uh, Ranjit your experience because Make My Trip, I believe, has an amazing business channel where you hired women on sabbatical. Yeah. They found it a, a very great way to hire great talent yeah. um, and as well as match it to their you know, expectations in terms of the way they want to manage their work life. So situation. I think your question in terms of how the organization or what are, what are the things that the organization is doing uh, the first, uh, you know, point that I'd like to urge all organizations to think about is to have a inclusion agenda for your inclusion agenda. Uh, what I mean by that is include people from your organization to be a part of the inclusion agenda. And I think that is very important. So if I think about Make My Trip, for example, we have a 35 member team, 50% men, 50% women, having the discussion about what should be our inclusion plan. 
and I think that is super critical for the organization to also start saying that, hey, this is important and I'm a part of it rather than it being like what Samir was saying earlier on, uh, you know, uh, coffee conversations around whether this is going in the opposite direction. So that's one piece. Specifically to, to the point that uh, you were asking regarding the channel, uh, I think the way we are looking at it as an organization is that we look at where does the talent and the capability lie and how do we make it possible or how do we create that opportunity for that talent to come out, irrespective of timing, location, work from home, etc. So we have, I mean, I, I'm selling holidays. Selling holidays means that you need to have an expertise in terms of the destination, being able to talk to the customers, etc. And I have a whole channel that, that is a regular call center that does it. I'm sure a whole bunch of people here have been, um, you know, pushed some holiday or the other from Make My Trip. But apart from that, what we did was we also tapped onto this uh, available talent uh, of uh, homemakers who have, you know, been in uh, doing work before or have traveled in their life and would like to be a part of this effort. So we have about 500 plus what we call holiday experts who work from home, have flexible timings, are able to complete their work within you know, the time frame that they would like to. And what we do is that we provide them with the technology that is needed, we provide them with the leads that are needed, needed to be able to drive the business. Now that's just a smart way of saying there is talent available, I'm breaking up the whole process and saying where is my talent available and how do I pick you know, and give that opportunity for the talent. So uh, it's a fantastic program. We've got uh, great reviews back from all our holiday experts. And um, talking about business impact, I think this it's one of our fastest growing channels. That's fantastic. Um, this is one thing which I wanted to ask some of you guys. Last year, uh, Microsoft CEO, Satya Nadella, um, he had made in one of the forum, a question was asked, that how should women get ahead in tech world? And a lot of you are guys from the IT, ITS space. Um, and he actually replied, I'll put a quote and quote over here. Women in technology should not ask for raises, but have faith in system. It is not really about asking for the race, but knowing and having faith in that system that will actually give you the right raises as you go along. Now this created a lot of furor in the media. Without giving my personal opinion on this, I would like to first understand what is your, each one of you's personal reaction, how you think that organization should react or take care of this kind of situation, and anything which you would like to add on to it. So I think for me, uh, it's not, uh, do I agree with the point that employees as a whole, not just women or men. He specifically said women in technology yeah. should not ask for raises. So if it is just, you know, if he meant just the women should not ask and the men should surely ask for raises, then I don't agree with that at all, right? Uh, should people overall trust the system and the organization and not just focus on the raises but look at it as a career? I endorse that completely. Have none of you ever asked for raises? Of no. course we have. I, have I mean, I have every asked. Every year, whether we yeah. get them is a separate issue. But <laughs> we ask, we ask them no, but uh, to, be, to be very honest, uh, uh, speaking for myself, I've not asked for a raise. And I actually completely agree with Ranjit's uh, point of view. In fact, there's a long context to that uh, interview, by the way. So when taken that out, it, it, does, it does give a, a perspective. And he, he, got, he got the appropriate whiplash for that. So let's, let's take that for what it is. But given the context, if he implied men should ask for raises and women should not, and that, that was discriminatory, then absolutely nobody out here thinks that that's the case. But if the belief is that get on, trust the system, then that's important. I just want to respond to another question of yours earlier in terms of what organizations should do. And I just want to say what organizations should not do. And this is a classic example of what should not have happened in a Microsoft uh, situation given the kind of uh, feedback it got. The last thing you want, so everyone says it's a board initiative, you should do the right things, et cetera, et cetera. The last thing you need to avoid is not walk the talk. Uh, in fact, we are, yes, please go ahead. No, specific to the controversial point, uh, uh, you know, it's not so much uh, about uh, women uh, in technology since it's specific to technology and I'm from that field. Uh, I think every individual has a right, every employee has a right to ask for a raise and they do. Uh, it's not all of them ask, some of them get and, and that's the way the world is. Uh, but it, the important dimension is the second part of that entire thing, where the system takes care or not. And I think it's an important element of an alert that has to be there. So, uh, you know, for, for instance, you take a rating, you take a, an annual increase,
increment uh, spread of what we do in the industry, whether it's 8%, 10%, how is it distributed across gender uh, and, and different cuts that you have. Similarly, promotion. So these are all elements of data analysis that will tell you whether the organization is having a fair play, the ecosystem is fair enough or not. I think that's key. If that is there, you're not dependent on an individual's whims and fancy, the organization corrects itself. I would think that's a bigger point than uh, you know the other element of whether somebody should ask for a raise or not. Yes, Sanjay, go yeah. ahead. Uh, because we are talking of the data points, let me table one data point. Uh, we launched our. Came out with agenda. Yes, so so the monster salary index report that we launched in uh, January of this year, along with IMM, the Bath and Wage Indicator Board of uh, Netherlands, it states that women are paid 27 percent less than men across all industry sectors. And it could vary. For example, in banking financial sector, the difference could be 19%. So, and, and I don't want to comment on uh, the Microsoft Chiefs, uh, this thing, because I'm not... Being safe. Yeah, no, no, that's being... Because I'm not aware of the context and the situation that was being given. But I don't think so in today's scenario. Uh, an organization can be successful in the wrong, long run if you are having a discriminative uh, you know, policy and, and, and agenda. And again, the point on the table is that organizations really need to reflect back because when you are looking at women and you are looking at continuity over five years or 10 years, is it that you really pay them less as compared to men? Because so you're I, not sure. I've got to say that, uh, not in defense of the financial services industry, right? But I've got to say that at least, you know, in Barclays, we did this cut, right? And we saw, frankly, we didn't see too much disparity. I have to say that. Uh, you know, Satya Nadella's comment kind of prompted me to say that, you know, should we actually have a look at, you know, we don't look at it consciously because you're not trying to discriminate at the front end, right? But when we ran the results, I have to say that there was some amount of trepidation in me that, you know, I wonder what it'll come up with. It didn't actually come up with a big difference. But I do feel that, um, generally speaking, my personal experience has been that women are less likely to want to ask what their due is as opposed to men. I think women kind of, generally speaking, right, want to work on the assumption they're going to put their head down, do a good job, and the organization should take care of it in a natural course, as opposed to, you know, men maybe sometimes lobby a bit more, right? Now, it's, it's a general comment, it's not true for everybody. But I, I do feel that, uh, yeah, maybe sometimes women... Organization was very supportive, everything was good, they gave me flexi working hours, work from home, all kinds of stuff. Of course, a lot of travel, but yet managed somehow. In my performance review, uh, the, I mean, if you look at the revenues, were not impacted, nothing. But in my performance review and everything, the boss was equally fair, I thought at that point of time. It's only when you go out and, of course, whatever said and done, they say salaries are confidential, the perks are confidential and everything, but people do talk. And when you go out and then you realize it and then you feel a little cheated. But as a woman, I felt awkward going and asking because I felt they're doing a lot of favor to me at that point of time, which now I realize they were not. They just wanted to retain a good talent. At this kind of a juncture, what advice would you give to the male managers and what advice would you give to the woman? Yeah, so for the male managers, I'm just going to go back to the point which is you need to make sure that the entire benchmarking process and the way the organization is getting the communication out in terms of how salaries are being handled overall is super critical. I mean, we just went through our cycle uh, just last month just end of March, uh, we have a whole process, uh, you know, before any communication is made, a whole benchmarking process which takes all the possible slices and cuts where the managers as well as, you know, two level up get to see what are the salary plans that are being made. So I think building that confidence within the organization and communicating that upfront is super critical. I think not being happy with what you've got uh, is one piece which I've seen across and uh, be it men or women, uh, benchmarks always, uh, are, you know, you look at a benchmark and you say, this is not working for me. Uh, that's a common phenomenon across. Uh, it just takes a different uh, tone if your communication is not right. So my advice to the male managers is get that right and communicate that across. One of the operational details on that one is don't send out an email just to the women managers. Send it out to everybody. You know, make sure that that is part of your inclusion process, so to say. And that is irrespective of what your personal situation or stage in life is, is just to say that this is how the organization is looking at it. And now you have like a surrogate to match it off with. If you think that you're, you're un being unfairly treated there, let's have a conversation. I think that's, that's what I would, uh, you know, managers need to be on the front foot on this one. You can't wait for the conversation at the end of it. 
and uh, talk post mortem. There cannot be any a secrecy or a black box, uh, you know, phenomenon. Unfortunately, yeah. most of the bonuses and yeah, yeah. Is so in black box. I, yeah. so my HR head tells me that the scientific process for calculating all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I, I understand that the scientific Arika, process. Let me, yeah. let me make a potentially controversial remark here. I love that. Um, so a a bonus or a variable pay is a black box to the people who are getting it, but at some point, somewhere, somebody is calculating it based on a formula that has to be reviewed, approved by most compensation committees and most boards and so on and so forth. So actually, it's not a black box, it just might be transparent to some, opaque to some. Correct. In my personal experience, when we keep talking about you know, male managers, I'll, I'll, I'll say that male managers or male approvers or deciders of such compensations, performance appraisals and all, they have been so hammered, especially in the last decade about, you know, equality and so on and so forth. A, if I talk about myself or, and, and, and many other men, we probably have been told by our wives, our sisters, our other women colleagues, you don't even know what we women go through. So we have kind of said, okay, fine, fair enough. So don't even dare going there. B, even if you feel that there's some kind of reverse discrimination happening, you know it is socially, politically so unacceptable to even Consider voicing it that you keep shut at such meetings. And see, you genuinely actually do believe that it is an important part of the workforce, you do need it to work. So in my experience, having been now a partner for seven, eight years or so and been part of these committees and the organizations I've worked for, I have never seen a male even formally or informally voice an opinion that would appear discriminatory. I have four instances where I've seen women at that level voice that. And what would that be? I mean, it's very similar. So simple example, real life example. We are into consulting, we sell work and we deliver work. The revenue we sell and the revenue we deliver is one of the three, two, three, four criteria to rate people. You have a woman who's gone on maternity leave and she works for let's say three months in a year. So her sales or revenue is proportional to work done in three months in a year. All the policies will say, yes, but you have to equate it over a year as if she has worked over a year so that there's no discrimination. All fair and understood. Now, this specific instance, the woman who's, who's chairing that thing, when we have come up against two individuals, a male who's worked for 12 months and delivered, let's say, 100 rupees of revenue, and a woman who's done three months and has delivered, let's say, 25 rupees of revenue, which is proportionately the same, and you have to choose one of the two for a certain bonus or a certain promotion, etc. Now, in such a situation, if you have a person who says, okay, but look, at the end of the day, this, this woman cannot deserve the same that the man deserves, because at the end of it, she's done only three months, then that's discriminatory by most policies, most decisions that we know of. But the only times I've heard that being said in a formal compensation meeting or performance meeting is by women. So this thing about you know, men being the thing, actually, you need to think what are women who attain that level of seniority actually driving? Any comments on this, Sanjay, Vial? Uh, no, I, I think uh, it, this is a tough one, what he <laughs> just uh, posed. Because from an HR perspective, uh, you know, while uh, structurally in our own system, we put 90% uh, of HR business partners are women, but, and it's just a coincidence. And that sort of ensures a certain amount of, uh, you know, watchfulness in terms of uh, uh, you know, extreme behavior. Now, the, the other dimension of specific case that you just mentioned, uh, you, you know, you can interpret it in terms of the business impact leading to a bonus uh, 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 distribution or an increment. An increment has to have a different uh, approach. A bonus is more of a business impact that is sort of leading to a distribution of something beyond. So you could have a different approach to that. So there's nothing wrong or right or wrong in the approach you take as long as you're transparently sharing that and communicating that and it is seen to be a fair approach. I think that's the key. There's nothing right or wrong in this. But let's not equate a bonus. I am liking this debate. I would <laughs> yeah. like to know more I would, who has an I, answer I would tend to agree with what Rajiv just said. Yeah. Uh, what is it fair? Uh, is it fair? E yeah. Equating? So, so, so it's um, like this: when you are having a discussion around uh, performance and output, um, and and there are certain metrics, right? Every organization has that, and I think there is a transparency in the way a person is evaluated. And when you table it, and it's to the displeasure to the other person, I just don't understand why it takes the gender tonality at that point of time. It's not a gender issue at all. It's a performance issue, right? And, and then the tonality being taken that it's a gender discrimination 
which puts the entire ball back and, and we just keep debating on the issues, which I don't think so is an issue anymore, right? It's all about performance output. There are as, uh, you know, the, the systems with most of the organizations have and most likely these agendas are driven by CEOs themselves. For example, in Monster, it's in my KPI. I'm responsible for that particular agenda. Right? So I don't think so that we should go that path. Yes, we should question it if the evaluation uh, metrics have been unfairly deployed. That's the point of debate. So I have a very specific question to what Raji just picked up. He has actually put a honest nest out here. In this kind of a situation, and this question is open to the audience as well, in this kind of a situation, what would be fair having a woman having an equitable you know, similar kind of a bonus, payout and a promotion or whatever, be the uh, performance rating to the man who has delivered 12 months of work and she's delivered three months of work, and why? Anybody we can take sorry, maybe sorry, I, I, I mean, just, just if I can just uh, yeah. pipe in a bit. I, I do think it's a gender related thing because at the end of the day, the specific example uh, that he's given is uh, at a life stage where yeah. one of the managers has not been able to work for part of the year. Uh, I do believe also that splitting it up, like what I said earlier on, is splitting it up to that particular year, that particular level, that particular assignment, uh, and then expecting that that is also going to be exactly equal is probably an unfair way to look at it. So the way to think about it, and my point of view on that one is that being, as an organization, if you're super clear that there are certain parts of your comp which are completely connected with business for this year, and there is certain part of your comp and how we're going to handle your comp as well as your future earning potential, depending on the work that you do over a five year, 10 year, 15 year period, then you're separating it out nicely. I hope you're recording this. And we're going yes, to play yeah, that no, I, I'm serious. I mean, we talk about giving women a work life balance, but the men are the ones, I mean, I mean, maybe they're happy about it. They're not, they don't have to be at home taking care of the kids, but if you make, let them go at five o'clock and take care of the kids, the women can also work. So. It should but be actually the work timing culture. It's the work timing culture. I really love that question, my yeah, So I, on the first one, on the first one, uh, I'd just like to go back to the channel that we were talking about. So we, sorry? Yeah, so going back to the office, I'll just come to that. I, I think there are options that are available where, like what you said, people who would want to do flex, either from home or even come to office and do that. So that is one, uh, you know, there are channels that are opening up and we just talked about what Make My Trip is doing. The second piece that I've seen really work well is that folks who have gone on either a sabbatical or a break, for them to come back into an organization, one piece that has always helped me is to pick up a good high impact project, which is going to be important uh, as a part of the agenda, driven agenda by the organization, but can be done with flex work timing. And matching that off with the employee who's coming in, after having taken a break, just does wonders for the confidence of the, uh, the person who's coming back, for the organization because they can get a high impact work out of it and you kind of seamlessly, it's almost like you've done a pit stop and you're coming back onto the track at a very, very high pace. So I, I, I think that's another piece that organizations should think about. Yeah, so we, we kind of have a formal flexi working policy. You can choose to work, you know, instead of five days XR, you can do three days, you know, half time or, you know, various permutations and combinations, right? And, and then. The, 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 I, I guess the key thing in this is it has to be work which lends itself to that kind of thing right. and you have to agree this with your supervisor, right? And, and I think, have we seen a huge uptake in this? Not really, but I think as a safety net for, uh, you know, men and women, I think it's a, it's, it's a policy that, you know, we, we think has been quite appreciated in the organization. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from a, from a contractual and a full-time job, I think it's more of a mindset issue. The data point shows that the, the contractual jobs are actually better paying than a full-time job. Right, so, so most, depending on your situation on a personal as well as a professional life, I think you should be more open to taking these contractual jobs. It will give you the variety, it will give you the exposure working for various employers and maybe you can undertake two or three projects at the same time. Um, on a lighter note that yes, for last three days I am babysitting and my wife is away for work. Ah, <laughs> lovely. Thank you so much guys and really appreciate it and my closing remarks on this, if women are looking to
come back again, just a point to add on this. Women are coming, wanting to come back to work, come after sabbatical. Please relook at your skills, reskill yourself, start connecting with people, start looking at greater opportunities, and start thinking about what new opportunities have come in. As well as taking time off, create a culture around you, and these men are already doing it. And really appreciate the time and the efforts you took over here to come, share your thoughts, and lovely having you over. Thank you so much. Thank you.